We have been everywhere. From the highest peaks to the deepest fathoms. We have seen everything from the smallest elements to the farthest corners of space. We have built empires, defied gravity, conquered the elements. We have cured diseases, made a heart beat again, made the impossible possible again. Who are we? We are humanity. And there is no limit to what we can accomplish together. Hey, good morning, ACC. Yeah, we are starting a brand new series. If, if you follow me on Facebook or, or follow our, our Rundle uh, Christian Church page on Facebook, you already know how excited I am about this series. I'm really glad you're here because we are going to, we're going to talk about something pretty awesome over the next five weeks. But before I tell you about that, first, uh, you remember these, you got these on your way in. The middle section here, I just want to draw your attention because this is like my baby for the next uh, six weeks. Uh, because on October 15th, we are launching our third service. In other words, we are making room for, for growth here at Arundel Christian Church, and we want you to be prepared. And in order for you to be prepared and our church to be prepared, we all need to be on the same page. And if you go to arundelcc.org slash one more, it will tell you all about our transition to three services and what that means for you and your family. Here's the big piece. The really big part of this one more idea is that we're asking you to adopt our attend one, serve one. Which means if you are a regular attender here or a member here at ACC, we want to ask you to, to be willing to make Sundays a two-hour thing. In other words, come one hour to attend and stay a second hour to serve somewhere. Now remember, if you can cut a bagel, you can serve here. We have all sorts of opportunities. My, my daughter Madeline, she, she came this morning and she helped us cut bagels in half and it was awesome. There is something for everyone to do and not all of our service opportunities are every week. Uh, sometimes they're, for the most part, they're every other week or every other month. So we want, to, we want you to get plugged in. We need 200 additional people serving on a Sunday morning uh, before October 15th. And we already have a ton signing up. So if you haven't yet, uh, don't miss out on this opportunity. Go to arundlecc.org slash one more and sign up. Fair enough? Awesome. All right, let's dive in. Who needs God? Brand new series. Yeah, raise your hand. Sure. Who needs God? We all do, right? I want to tell you a little bit about this series. It's, it's basically, uh, it's unlike anything we've done before because it's five, uh, it's basically one long sermon broken up into five weeks because none of you, I don't think, want to stay here two and a half hours today to hear me. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this one long sermon, this idea of who needs God, and we're going to break it up into five pieces. So what that means for you is it's not going to make a complete sense if this is your only Sunday that you make, or if you're like, hey, I'm not going to come next week, and I'm going to come. Imagine watching a movie that way. It would be weird. So don't. It, try to, if you can, make our Who Needs God series a five-week commitment for you and your family uh, to really make this make sense. Now, here's another thing that that means. You might walk out of t here today and think, Matt didn't use very much scripture today. Now, if you know me, that's not normal. We love God's word here, and we use it uh, constantly as, uh, from, from the pulpit. But because this is one sermon broken up into five parts, today you're kind of getting the intro. And if you know anything about intros, they usually don't have a lot of scripture involved. So there's not going to be a ton today, but bear with me. We're going to get there. All right? Fair enough. Okay. Um, you know my favorite thing about Arundel Christian Church? One of my favorite things about our culture here? is that you don't have to believe like we do before you belong. You can come into this church uh, questioning. You can come into this church disbelieving. You can come into this church however you are, and you belong here just like that. Uh, you don't have to believe like I do to belong here. And I think uh, somewhere, somewhere along the line, we got this idea in church that church wasn't a place 
to ask questions. That somehow you just kind of kind of come in the doors and it's all about faith. And if you have too many questions, that that's not a good thing in church. Like somehow we're like somehow God is afraid of your questions. And I don't believe he is. I don't believe that this is a place where we ought to not ask hard questions, like this incredibly hard question of who needs God, or even more difficult questions of is there a God? And what an incredible place to ask yourself that question and to discover the truth of some of your questions than in a place where you belong before you believe. Fair enough? I'm gonna, man, I'm gonna keep saying fair enough because we're, we're like, this is like a lecture style teaching because uh, just trust me, you guys are, trust me. All right, here we go. Um, you know, I think a lot of people who struggle with doubt and disbelief in their faith, one thing they have in common um, is that they, they've never really had any legitimate answers to their questions. Either they've been afraid to ask their questions. Or when they asked their questions, they, re- they received childlike answers to what is supposed to be a mature adult faith. And those answers, at the end of the day, just aren't sufficient. And you end up saying, you know, I, it just doesn't make sense. I, you, you, it, I, I, I'm gonna, I don't believe. I'm gonna, I, don't, I don't believe this. I doubt this. And I want to kind of open up for the next five weeks that we... We recognize that this is going to be a safe place to come and to have real questions and to to take some time to really not be afraid because God doesn't mind our questions. Let me give you an example of of this. When when I say that we we get in this idea of we're asking adult questions to a childhood faith, some of you, that's where you're at right now. You doubt, you doubt God. You doubt the existence of, of God or of a higher power. You, you doubt it because you have, uh, maybe when you were younger, you had a, a childlike understanding of faith. Maybe someone told you about Jesus, someone told you about God, and you understood. Maybe you saw something from someone else, like you, you saw religion from afar. And whatever you experienced, whatever you learned, it developed this childlike faith, and then you matured past it. And now you're asking adult questions of that childhood faith. And to be honest, it just doesn't stand up anymore. Let me give you an example. A good example is this. Where do babies come from? You see, when a five-year-old, when my five-year-old asks me that question, the way I answer that question, I don't lie to her. I do not tell her anything that's untrue, but I do not answer that question the same way I do my 12-year-old daughter when we have that same conversation. You see, that conversation is a whole lot different. That conversation is, all right, sit down, we're going to do this once, right? And then the conversation is a lot more in-depth and a lot more uncomfortable, and the same way if I were having this conversation with a med school student. Now that conversation would be way over my head. They would, the conversation would be, the, the words that are used and the, the understanding of what's happening is going to be way over my, my head. That, again, that whole conversation is going to be completely different. And what some of us have done when we were young or, or kind of introduced into the idea and this concept of following God or believing in God, we, we started by asking this question, and we got the five-year-old mommy's tummy answer. That's what we, some of us, we still have a mommy's tummy God. And at some point, a mommy's tummy God isn't going to cut the snuff anymore. It's just not going to fulfill the, the mature questions that you have. And we have to understand that you know, when you, when you turned away from God because he doesn't make sense anymore because of your childlike understanding of him, that maybe the God you know, the God someone told you about, isn't a real God at all. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I'm really excited about this. We're going to talk about um, the God's... Uh, of the nuns. And when I say that the nun gods, I'm not talking about N U N God. I'm not talking about Catholic nuns. I'm talking about N O N E, nuns. Have you heard of this word before? It's a label 
that has been given to a, a, a rising, an incredibly quick rising number of people alive right now. They're called the nuns. And basically what a nun is, N-O-N-E, is someone who says, you know what, I am choosing to not be affiliated with any uh, spiritual belief system. I I've, I I've understand about uh, what other people believe, but I'm choosing not to believe also. I'm choosing to not uh, be on this side, and I'm not choosing to be on that side. I'm not choosing to pick this or that. I'm choosing to just be have no religious affiliation. I'm choosing to be a nun. And what we're going to look at this morning is the nuns and, and the gods that many of them believe in. Or the reason that they, the, the, the nuns that, that, the gods that the nuns have stopped believing in and how they're not actually uh, gods at all. And I want to be honest with you, I'm going to own this. A lot of this frustration is the church's fault. Many of you, the god that you learned about, the god that maybe doesn't exist at all, somehow you learned about so, you, this god or you learned about this, this belief system from someone within the church and maybe even on the pulpit. And you had a pastor or a, a mima or someone who told you something about God and that, that answer that you got, that, that was a five-year-old version of God and that God isn't doing the trick anymore. See, there's, you have to understand that there's two sides to this. There's this one side where you believe in God and you have to understand that there, there is some incredible things about Christianity that are very unsettling. Even someone who's been following Christ their whole life, you can look at the Bible and you can look at history and you can look at things that have happened in the name of God and in the name of Christ. And you can say, well, that's, that's really unsettling. Or you can find things that you, you can't technically prove. So you're like, oh, this just, just doesn't settle things in my mind. So there's one side that can be very unsettling. And then the other side, those who claim to be atheists... And say, you know what, I don't have a belief in God at all. Uh, that is also really, really not a good thing. So on one side, you have this unsettling belief uh, that, that can't be fully uh, explained. And on the other side, you have this atheism, a, a disbelief in all God. And that is also uh, not very settling. To think about it, to, to say, I'm going to just uh, boil it all down and you're just a bunch of biology and, and physics. And, and, and ultimately, there's nothing keeping this all together. That causes despair. So on both sides, it can be really, really tough. And what we find is in the most, for the most of us, we find ourselves stuck somewhere in the middle. We find ourselves stuck in the middle with doubt and despair. And, and we're trying to wrestle with this question of, do we really believe that there's a God? And we're going to have some time this morning to talk about that. So I want to ask you, if you're here this morning and you've, you've lost your faith, or you have doubts in the existence of God, or you say, you know, some of you, you're like, I don't really believe, but I'm here because it's good for my kids to be in church. I'm really glad you're here, because I want you to know that, that it's not, don't be afraid to have doubted the existence of God. In fact, it's, it's since since the beginning of time, humanity has struggled with disbelief in God. Check out this quote from Richard Dawkins. He's a famous atheist, and here's what he says. He says, we are all atheists about most of the gods that humanity has ever believed in. Some of us just go one God further. You Think about it. Many of us struggle with, with doubt, obviously, because of all the gods that have ever been taught or existed or were believed to be real, most of us in this room would say, I don't believe in those gods. And this uh, Richard Dawkins in The Devil's Chaplain, he's basically saying, listen, I'm just like you. I just go one god further. See, even the early Christians were considered atheists because they did not believe in the gods that everyone else in, in the, you know, the world were believing in. So people looked at them and said, you are uh, an atheist. And our response, obviously, would be, we're, we believe in God, just we believe you've got the wrong gods. And Let's take a look at this this morning. Let's pray together. Father, I ask that as we spend some time talking about gods that don't really exist, 
that you would help us to understand more about who you are, the God I believe really does exist. Be with us this morning so that we can hear from you. Those who doubt you or don't believe in you at all, God, I pray that you would soften their hearts this morning to be able to hear from you and that you might reveal truth about yourself to them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think there's two things that cause doubt and disbelief. And the two things, just so you kind of have a game plan for what we're going to talk about today and what we're going to talk about next week. And what we're going to talk about today and next week are, are the two things that I think cause doubt and disbelief. And the first thing is this. It's a somebody told me so God. You see how I put a lowercase g there because these are gods that don't exist. These are gods that somebody somewhere along the way told you about, but they're not real at all. And because of those gods, you've questioned or walked away from faith or chosen not to follow God at all because that's the God that you had in your mind. Next week, we are going to talk about a Bible tells me so Jesus. And it is going to be uh, maybe the most uncomfortably liberating sermon you've ever heard. So uh, I'll just leave it at that, a little teaser. Make sure you don't miss next week when we talk about a Bible tells me so Jesus. So there's these gods that don't exist. Let's, uh, let's start with the first one. The first god doesn't exist. We're going to call the bodyguard god. This is a god that, that doesn't allow bad things to happen to good people. Somewhere... Along the way, I don't know why, but, but when you're maybe in Sunday school as a five-year-old and somebody's explaining God to you, we like to give this idea that God is somehow like a bodyguard, that, that God somehow is this God that does not allow bad things to happen to good people. And then you walk out of that church and it doesn't take like 24 hours before you're like, wait, what? Because bad things happen to good people all the time. Bad things are happening to people all around us. Bad things are happening to us. And I, it's, it's it very, let me just say this right away. If, if you ever learned about bodyguard God, and you put your faith in bodyguard God, and then you experienced actual life and realized that bodyguard God doesn't exist, and you stopped believing in that God, let me just say, good don't believe in bodyguard God. See, bodyguard God doesn't exist. If you think about it, Christianity from the very beginning started. The whole story of Christians started with something very bad happening to a very good person. In fact, the whole first century of Christianity, you see people who loved God and had dedicated their lives to, to serving Him and nothing but bad bad things were, was happening to them. And it was just an incredible example that if, if this was your theology of who God is, if you went into adulthood, you had your childlike faith, and you carried that God into adulthood, and you're thinking, this is a good God who can't possibly allow bad things to happen to good people, that is going to be destroyed and torn down in, in no time at all. We don't even have to look farther than what's happening right now in our, our world with our weather and with fires and with earthquakes. And if right now you're thinking, if there's a God, the only type of God there could be is this bodyguard God who doesn't allow bad things to happen to good people, I want to say I'm really glad that you stopped believing in that God. I want to encourage you not to believe in that God. Because that God doesn't exist. We're actually going to spend a whole sermon on bodyguard God in uh, three weeks. Here's another God. It's called Goosebump God. This is the God whose presence we can always feel. You guys know what I'm talking about. This is like the, if you've ever been to a summer camp or a Christian camp and you, or a retreat, and there's like this incredible worship experience, and the, the preacher gets up and says something, and you're just sitting there, and maybe you're in tears, and you can literally feel goosebumps, and, and when they're singing, you want to put your hands up in the air, and you're just like, man, I feel the presence of God in this place. 
And then that experience is over and you come back to, to maybe your normal experience with church and with, with life groups and with friends and you're thinking like, I, I don't feel the presence of God. You come in maybe even this morning and you see someone in front of you and they, they got their hands up and you're thinking, are we in the same room? I don't feel it. Like Maybe they're faking it. And I don't know who told us at some point that, listen, that the God that is in the Bible is a God that you are always going to feel present. It's a God that no matter what, you're going to just know he's there because that's not the God that the Bible talks about. That's not the God I love. The God I love is not always going to feel like he's standing next to you. And yet somehow we've got ourselves caught up in believing that's who God is And if that is your version of God, goosebump God, I want to encourage you to stop believing in that God. And for many of you, you already did. You already said, you know what, I've given up on God because I can't feel his presence. Kind of an interesting thought, a sidebar, if you will. This is for free. You're least aware of the things in your life that are constant. Think about this for a minute. You're least aware of the things in your life that are constant. Here's what I mean by this. None of you today are going to look at the person to your right or left and say, you know what? The weather is, or the temperature in here is just perfect. That's not something we do. We don't wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I feel like an American. <laughs> like, those things are constant, right? When you notice that the temperature's uh, too hot or too cold, that's when you look at your neighbor and say, it's too hot in here, it's too cold in here, because the things that are, are constant, the things that we expect and, and make us feel comfortable, those are the things in life that we most often don't notice and we don't say anything about. Just keep that in mind when you're thinking about goosebump God. Here's a third one. This is a on-demand God. This is the God who replies to fair and selfless requests the way I would. You guys remember when if you wanted to watch a show on TV, you had to actually be in front of the television at that time (laughs) on that channel? Do you remember this? This is like, (laughs) like seriously, you wanted to watch an episode of Friends, you had to like get in front of your television at the right time, and if you were like had other plans, you had to rearrange them because that's when it was on. It wasn't on tomorrow. It's not. And now we have this awesome thing called what? On demand, right? If you want to watch something, it's simple. You just press this button, and you can pick what you want, and you can watch it whenever you want. You can go back eight seasons and watch them all at once, right? This on demand concept, and somehow we've been tricked we've been not not purposely I don't think anyone's like told you about these gods to try to trick you but somehow someone along the way has got you to believe that God is this on-demand God that if you ask him something that's selfless listen I'm not asking for anyone to die I'm not asking for anything bad to happen to anyone I'm asking for a really good thing so God if you are real clearly you're going to do this thing that I'm asking for And then, in many of our instances, in many of our experiences, that God doesn't do what we ask. It doesn't turn out the way we wanted it to. And we end up with this disbelief in God. You know, we asked for an answer and we heard nothing. We asked for a sign and we saw nothing. We asked for a miracle and we received nothing. And we said, you know what? If God can't show me a sign when I want it, give me a miracle when I want it, do for me what I want, then there must not be a God at all. I'm going I'm to stop believing in God. And maybe, again, you've stopped believing in a God you ought to stop believing in because on-demand God doesn't exist. It scares me a little bit to think of what my life would look like right now if God gave me everything I asked for. I imagine the girl I wanted to marry in middle school. (laughs) I've been back on Facebook. (laughs) 
Um, so we just say, just be thankful that God doesn't give you everything you ask for. Here's another God. This is pedestal God. This is a God who is just like my pastor and other Christians. This is a God that somehow, when you, please, please do not believe in this God. Because listen, every human being on this earth, alive right now, including every person who's on staff of this church, including myself, we are messed up, sinful human beings. And what happens a lot of time is we, we get this idea that God is somehow like comparable to people that we've put on some sort of a pedestal in our life. And then when we get in an argument with that person, we, we say we basically we're in an argument with God in the church and we walk away from him altogether. When we see that person let us down, when people in the name and under the veil of religion do horrendous things, we look and say, whoa, if that person claims to love God, then I don't want anything to do with that God, and we walk away from God altogether. We somehow have put our faith in a God that is, that is somehow equal in caliber and, and amazingness as, as someone who he created. And if you stop believing in pedestal God, that's a really good thing. Mahatma Gandhi says this. He says, he says, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And we are guilty of that, aren't we? The people around us, they look to us for an example of what God looks like, and we so often let them down. And we need everyone in this room and everyone outside of this room to know, listen, my God that I love and serve is so much greater than I am. Do not look to me as an example of who God is. I hope you can look to me and see an example of what God is doing in my life and that he's a good, good God, but man, I'm going to let you down. And when I let you down, I don't want that to make you turn away from the real God who does exist. Here's another one. This one's really, really hard. This is called guilt God. Guilt God is the God who controls you through guilt and fear. This is a God that we try to run from as quickly as we can. This is the God that we want to get away from. This is a God that, man, we just, for whatever reason, he's sticky and we just can't get this God off of us. And, and this is the, the, this guilt God that, that reminds you of all the things uh, that you've done wrong. And this, this God that, that, you know, this is a God that loves you, but he doesn't like you very much. This is a, the God that if you have something fun or enjoyable in your life, the answer is no. You want to do something sexual, the answer is no, no, no. You know, this is, this is the, the guilt God that it doesn't matter what it is in your life. If you find something enjoyable or you, whatever, this, this God is just, another name for guilt God is, is kill joy God. This God that doesn't want you to experience any joy in your life and instead wants you to just wallow in your mistakes. And some of you, because this is the version of God that you have in your mind or your heart right now, you said, you know what, I want to get as far away from this God as possible. Even if I have a hard time shaking him off, I'm going to do whatever I can to get away from guilt, God. And I want to tell you, if you were able to, congratulations. Because guilt, God, doesn't exist. Here's another one. This is the anti-science God. This is a God that you can't reconcile with science. Somehow, somewhere along the way, we've been told that we're forced to choose between unreliable religion and undeniable science. And that somehow, listen, here are your two options. 
You have to choose between them. In fact, you've probably maybe heard it this way before. And if you have, I'm not putting this quote up there as like the right thing. So just don't take a picture of it and share it and say, this is Matt's quote. Uh, <laughs> some of you uh, maybe have, have heard this before. Quit thinking and start believing. And this is not, this is not a good thing. Like to somehow think that the God that we, that we follow and the, the, the real God, in order to have any faith in this God, you have to just turn off your mind that God is completely anti-science. And you just have to, to turn on the faith. And I don't know where we got this idea. I don't know where we got that God from. And a quote from Richard Dawkins again. In his book, The God Delusion, he says this, One of the truly bad effects of religion is that it teaches us that it is a virtue to be satisfied with not understanding. And the problem is that many of us, our Sunday school God, the God we learned about as as a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, that God can't be reconciled with science. So you think you have to choose between the two. But here's what I want to, I want to challenge you with this thought. Is that God or science is a false alternative. Anytime you are under the impression that you have to choose between God or science. That somehow both don't go beautifully together. That God hasn't provided this thing called science to us as a means to discover how awesome his creation is. You see, God created science. God loves giving us the the minds and the ability and the wisdom to go and figure out, you know, I believe that God created everything. And I believe that God created science as a tool for us to be able to discover how he did it. And it shouldn't scare us to go and try to figure out things that we don't know yet. Sometimes we, you know, this, uh, this other idea of like this, this gap God, of God is the God who can explain everything uh, that we don't yet know. This is a, another God where it's like, hey, uh, we don't know how this happens yet, so God must be the answer. Well, guess what? In 10 years, we might figure out the answer to that. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't exist because we now know what we didn't know before. And in the church, we are so guilty of this statement. I mean, think about it for a minute. If you have a child who is sick, let me just talk to believing Christians in here for a minute. Everyone else, stay with me. But if you are in this room right now and you have put your faith in Christ, I want to ask you this question. When your child is sick, where do you take them? You take them to the hospital. You take them to the doctor. And then they they run tests, right? Right? And then they, they take that you know, sample to the lab where they use science to figure out what's going on. And then you sit by the phone because you want to hear the science behind what's happening to your kid. You are not anti-science. In fact, with, when that doctor calls, if that doctor says, hey, listen, I'm so glad you answered. I just want to tell you, we found the results of the lab test and what we realized is God is trying to teach you something. Like, what? That's not what we're looking for. We're saying, listen. Here's what I want, doctor. I want a natural explanation and a natural solution. I want you to use science to figure out what is going on in the the body of my child. And when we claim as a church that somehow there's this this faith in God and over here is science and you have to choose between the two. If if I've ever told you that or anyone has ever told you that and this anti-science God is a God that you believe in, I'm sorry because I don't believe that God exists. If you stop putting your faith in anti-science God, good. So these are the, the six that I have time to talk about this morning, none gods. There's the bodyguard God and goosebump God, on-demand God, 
pedestal God, guilt God, and anti-science God. If you stopped believing in God, and this is the version of God you were believing in, I want to say good. These gods don't exist at all. But if you've walked away from God altogether, you've walked away from faith altogether because the version of God that somebody told me so God that you had in your mind was one of these gods. I want to ask you, maybe you have walked away from God prematurely because the God you walked away from wasn't the God of the Bible at all. You see, that mommy's tummy version of who God is just wasn't holding up for you anymore. I want to be really clear. Today, it wasn't an argument for or against the existence of God. That's not what we did this morning. That's, we're going to get to that in our Who Needs God series, but I want you to know that, that today was not uh, an argument for or against the real God. It was simply an argument against these other gods that don't exist at all, that cause us to doubt our faith, that cause us to disbelief altogether. For many people in this world will cause them to never once ever consider God in their life because the God they have in their mind, this somebody told me so God, is one of these gods that doesn't exist. Maybe you walked away from faith prematurely. In Mark chapter 9, in verse 24, there's a story of a man who is, um, his son has been possessed, and he brings his son to God, and he says, God, if you, if you can, help my son. And God says, if I can, I can. Believe. And this is what the man says. He says, I believe. He kind of says, like, I, I believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And I want you to know this morning, this is my prayer for you. If you are in this room right now and you struggle with real doubt about the existence of God, or you've never even once kind of, kind of put your faith or, or ever stepped into that kind of that first step of, of any sort of belief in God, first of all, I'm really glad you're here. You belong here before you believe like I do. But I want to ask you to maybe say this prayer to a God that you're not even sure exists and to say, God, help me with my unbelief and be a part of what's going to happen over the next four weeks here. Next week, we're going to talk about a Bible tells me so Jesus. It's going to be the most disturbingly liberating message you've maybe ever heard. There might be a few people who walk out, um, just sneak out the sides so it's less distracting. Um, Listen, if you've walked away from Christianity specifically because of something in the Bible, that's what we're going to talk about next week. Let's pray together. God, I think of this, this statement in Mark, this man who says, God, help me with my unbelief. Every single person in this room, myself included, God, we go through seasons in our life where we doubt where we contemplate and think. And, and sometimes, God, we're afraid to ask hard questions. But I pray that you would help us to ask those questions, God, to, to be willing to say to you, help me with my unbelief. God, I pray that this would be a church where everyone who walks in this door would feel welcome and comfortable and would be willing to open up their mind and their heart to say, God, help me with my unbelief. God, because we want to be a church that knows you and that loves you and has people that are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. So we thank you for this time together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.